Now it's time for Chewing the Fat with your host, Bevan Jones. Well, g'day and welcome to another edition of Chewing the Fat. Bevo here, joined today by Robbie Cornswaite at the Fred's Cafe up in Oldgate. Mate, great to have you on Chewing the Fat. Um, of course, you've played for the Socceroos, played for Adelaide United, Western Sydney Wanderers, and you've spent your time playing overseas as well. You've had an amazing career. Um, talk us through it. Um, it actually started overseas in England, then you moved to Australia, and then how'd you end up at the Reds? Talk us through that. Yeah, well, basically I was just playing local uh, football, played for Adelaide City Juniors for about 10 years, and um, just sort of when that NSL finished, uh, the A-League was getting started. and. Um, you know, in, the, in those days, you needed to have three underage uh, signings, so three players under 20. Adelaide United decided to go for all local kids, um, so I trained and trialled with the team for about eight months, no pay. Um, and then, yeah, luckily enough, got a one-year deal, and then was able to sort of find my way from there. And uh, yeah, as you say. Have a have a decent enough uh, career, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> pretty handy. Yeah. Bit of time in Australia, bit of time overseas. Um, yeah. Let's talk about 2008-09 because that was an amazing year. You played, of course, um, in the Asian Champions League with the Reds in the A League and as well in the, in the FIFA World Cup. Now, talk us through that. Yeah, I mean that was um, obviously one of the most famous sort of times in, as a club for Adelaide United. And I mean, I was only like 23 years old at the time, so it was a bit of a whirlwind and a bit of a dream. But uh, you know, it just made history. I suppose. Unfortunately, we didn't get to go all the way, but um, you know, just that whole experience traveling around Asia, and I suppose that's where the sort of feeling of Asia for me started. We used to go to places like Bohung Steelers, and we used to say to each other, "Oh, do you reckon you could see yourself living here if you got an offer?" And we used to, some boys would say, "Nah, I don't, I don't fancy it." But you know, funnily enough, three, four years later, I've ended up in, in playing in South Korea for four years in a tiny, tiny little town. I think it was about 100,000 people there. Um, and yeah, it was probably the best time of my life, best time of my career. So that Asian Champions League sort of opened up the doors for me and a few others as well. We'll get to that in a moment. Um, obviously, you had to sort of bide your time in terms of getting into the starting lineup for the Reds. Um, you had to wait those few years. Uh, so 2005, you were first signed up and then you had to wait till 2008, 2009 to get your first starting gig with the Reds. Um, did you contemplate sort of changing club club during that time? or? No, I didn't. Um, to be honest, I don't think I was probably good enough to, one, to be able to get another club and two, to, to be able to change. So, uh, you know, some great players, Michael Balcanis, Ange Costanza, who you've had on the show before, uh, Christian Rees, Aaron Golding. Um, there, there was a lot of more experienced players and at that age, I, I was kind of like a bit timid. I was very soft. And John Cosmini used to used to give it to me a fair bit. He used to call me uh, all sorts of names under the sun. But yeah, I was probably um, I physically wasn't probably strong enough in terms of my strength and then um, and my aggression as well. So I played a lot more at right back initially. Um, although I'm six foot five, you know, it's a bit odd to see a, a right back that tall. But I had a decent engine. Um, and then yeah, slowly found my way into the side. And you know, as we know, that centre back position is really. Uh, a position that once you get experience and, and get better and better, you know, the older you are, usually the better you are. So, yeah, I had to wait my time, but uh, eventually got there, yeah. In 2009, you made your debut for the Socceroos against Kuwait. Talk us through that. That must have been amazing to represent your country. It was, no doubt, but um, it was kind of, uh, you know, with an asterisk next to it, in my mind anyway, because it was an A-League based uh, Socceroos side. So. As much as it was a great honour and, and the fact that I came off the bench late in that game, I think it was a draw down in Canberra, shows how good my memory is. Um, you know, I wanted to, to make the full soccer route, so to be able to then do that years later and, and play, get a little bit of a run and spend some time uh, around some of the, you know, the boys like Tim Cahill, Lucas Neal and all this, you know, that, that obviously means a lot more to me than the fact that I, I debuted, debuted, sorry, in a in an A-League sort of base side. Um, and I came on as a striker um, late on in that game. So, yeah, like I say, it's got an asterisk next to it, but obviously still incredibly proud. And who's been some of the biggest influences on your career? You mentioned uh, Timmy Powell and, and Lucas Neal, but any yeah. others as well you want to mention? Uh, well, probably um, those first few years at Adelaide United is when I probably had the most sort of uh, influence from the older boys. I think uh, Michael Valkanis, Richie Aligic, Ross Aloisi, um, you know, they're the sort of the three guys that come to mind um, in terms of, you know, my development and giving me that early sort of base uh, to kick on from. But funnily enough, the, the person who taught me the most was, was Tony Popovich. You know, it's no secret how much I, I admire Tony and what he does. Um, and, and, you know, now that I've moved on 
a little bit in, in sort of getting a little toe into the media. A lot of the things that I know about football, you know, I've learned very late on um, in terms of positioning and sort of, you know, how I think the game should be played. I didn't really pick that up until very, very late on in my career. And 2011, you uh, mentioned before you went over there and played in the K League with, yeah. with 100,000 people as a population, so yeah. a bit of a change from the A League. But, yeah. um, this must have been really like special for you to play overseas for the first time. Yeah, I mean, as a as a kid growing up, you want to play overseas. Obviously, Europe's the main goal, but. Uh, you know the plus one rule the rule that came in to say that um, you know Asian quota players can move around leagues and Australia was considered Asia that opened up you know the doors to players to go to China Japan and Korea and yeah when I got I got, I got the call on a Thursday I was about to book a, a holiday to Bali and um, they said yeah can you come I had no idea who the team was obviously I just knew it was a stronger league financially it would be a lot um, better for me to go there um, and yeah, within like two, three days I was there and when I landed I was just like, whoa, where the hell am I? It was quite daunting. Um, they put the pressure on me straight away to say, you know, we brought you here to be the leader, to control, to do this. And I still had doubts about my, my own abilities at that age. Like I still didn't think I was that good a player. Um, so to go there, develop, learn, become a better player, become that leader and just, yeah, to, you know, players go there in the last six months, I stayed for four years, so it's pretty, um, you know, pretty proud of that achievement. Um, and then, you know, when I did get a couple more moves later in my career, I kind of relished those moments of getting dropped in a new town, knowing where nothing was and sort of finding things, finding cafes, finding restaurants and things like that. So, yeah, just an amazing experience. I loved Korea and, um, yeah, just I wish I could go back and do it again. In <laughs> 2016, you came yeah. back and played the A-League again with the uh, Western Sydney Wanderers. Yeah. Did you kind of play playing for the Reds again? Or? Uh, yes and no. I mean, was, at that time, there, there wasn't a spot for me at Adelaide. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head who was there, but um, yeah, I never even spoke to them, to be honest. I just spoke to, to Wanderers and to, to Popper. And, um, you, knew, you know, Wanderers had just been in the grand final, so at Adelaide. Um, and then, yeah, he went there. It was difficult for me at the start. Spent probably five, six weeks in the in the youth team, um, playing the reserves. And then you know you fast forward like six, eight months later, and he, he, I was the captain. So yeah, it's, it was a it was a wonderful time. Like I honestly wish I got played there. You know you can't play everywhere, obviously, but um, you know if I'd been able to play there when I was 21, 22 under Tony Popovich, I feel like I could have been a, a you know even better player than what I was. And 2018, you went back and played over there in Malaysia, yeah. um, and it was obviously a bit of a short stint because you hung out the boots at the yeah. um, young age of 32. Uh, yeah. What was the reason behind this, Robbie? Um, just probably wasn't enjoying it um, that much. Uh, I went to to back to Malaysia for financial reasons, basically. I mean, Josip Gombau was at Western Sydney. Everyone knows uh, how that turned out, and I didn't. They offered me a new contract at the same time. I got this offer to go back overseas, um, and I was thought, you know, financially, uh, I might as well just do it. Six months later, wasn't really enjoying it that much. I had a bit of a, a chronic knee problem. And to be quite honest, I couldn't really be bothered to do all the rehab and everything that it would take for money to get better. Um, especially being over there, it's going to be quite difficult. Um, and I had an opportunity to do some punditry for the World Cup for basically the equivalent of Fox Sports in Malaysia. And if I was still playing, I wouldn't be able to do that. So I just thought, you know what, I could probably fight my way and keep playing for another 6-12 months, struggle, struggle through it. Or I can hang it up now and I could see a bit of a, a transition into another area that I was interested in. So, you know, I didn't sacrifice the last part of my career, but I decided, you know, I'd rather move into another area, sorry, uh, than to, to uh, keep playing. And you spend a bit of time, yeah, like you said, uh, you know, working on your media trade over there in, yeah. in, in Asia. That would be very interesting being an Aussie in an Asian country uh, yeah. doing a soccer show. So. Yeah, no, it was. I mean, uh, Obviously, it's an English-speaking uh, um, station, which obviously helped. Um, I did a bit of the, the World Cup, as I mentioned, and then off the back of that, they said, "Listen, uh, we think you've got some skills. Would you like to try to host um, a few things?" So I said, "Yep, no worries." So I was hosting two shows a week, co-hosting. Um, one was live on a Saturday, it was called Before Kickoff, a bit of a fantasy football game show with celebrity guests, and then I would do a show on a Monday where every week in Malaysia they'd fly over like ex Premier League legends so every week I was with like Lewis Saha, Stan Collymore, um, Sammy Hippier, 
all these guys and we'd basically drive around KL, try the food, meet, uh, meet fans, um, interview them in the car, a bit of a carpool karaoke setup, but it was more interview style and that would last five, six hours and then we'd edit that down into one hour show. So learnt a hell of a lot, met some of the biggest names in the game um, and yeah, just developed my skills with both live and pre-record. So back in Australia now and um, yeah, media is something that I'm, I'm extremely interested in and want to pursue and it's for me it's like football I'm just going to give it my absolute best I'm not going to let anyone stand in my way um, and if you're good enough uh, and enough doors open up then hopefully um, you know I can make uh, something out of it I'm sure you're absolutely killing mate uh, uh, do you plan on staying in the game as well like I know a bit of coaching I know you've got a, um, a young kid congratulations on that thank by you. the way yeah two yeah. actually oh, yeah. Two, oh, two yeah, yeah, yeah. so yeah. keep me busy yes um, Initially, like coaching is not something that really comes to mind. I do want to do my badges just to educate myself more, um, see the game maybe a little bit differently than uh, what you do as a player. Um, so that would be one one avenue. Um, ultimately, you know, if, if I ended up coaching a private school or maybe some NPL or uh, an assistant in the NPL, maybe. Uh, but it's not something I've given a, a hell of a lot thought to. But you know what, things change and life's long. Um, so who knows where I'll we'll end up. Yeah, wish you all the best, Robbie. I must admit, um, playing footy at Parry Hills back in the day, shout out to all the Parry Hills boys <laughs> yeah, yeah. to come down and you were such a, a great bloke in terms of Thank supporting you, that. So Thank you. That's just great to have you on Tuna Fat. Um, shout out to Ellis Gellios for filling, filming for us today and also some great research he's done to find out a bit more about Robbie and help me out. That's just awesome. Yeah. Thanks, Ellis, for that, mate. Um, you know, shout out as well to Pub Trivia in South Australia, which I do on a Wednesday night at West Oak Hotel. And if you're looking for a corporate event host or an MC, Devo's your man, so hit me up on Facebook or we'll send me a Facebook message. Um, Robert Callthorne, it's been an absolute pleasure having you, you on Tune the Fat, mate. Really Thanks appreciate so much. it. Thanks for having me, mate. Thank you to Anton Fitness as well for being our sponsor. See you next time, guys.